Genre. Realistic fiction deals with characters and events that seem real but are created by the author. As you read, notice how the author makes the characters and events come to life. Red Kayak, written by Priscilla Cummings, illustrated by Ron Mazellan. Question of the week: What inspires people to act courageously? On a cold spring morning, 13-year-old Brady Parks sees Mr. D'Angelo's red kayak heading down the creek toward the Corsica River. Brady knows that with the strong winds and the dangerous tides, it is not safe for boating. But he and his friends don't say anything. Now, Mrs. D'Angelo and her three-year-old son Ben are missing. While Brady's dad and the other rescue workers head downstream, they ask Brady to use his boat to check the smaller creeks. Can Brady and his yellow lab Tilly help find the red kayak before it's too late? And will he remember the rescue training he learned from Carl at the firehouse? Already, my eyes were scanning the shoreline for the red kayak or a splash of yellow. Mr. D'Angelo had told the police he couldn't remember what clothes his wife or son wore that morning, but he knew they had on yellow life jackets. Let's think about. What do you think will happen to Brady and Tilly as they search for the red kayak? Predict and set purpose. I felt excited, but a little panicked too, as I sped down the creek, squinting into the icy spray and scanning the thick tangle of brown brush and newly budding trees along the narrow shoreline. If that red kayak was out there, I wanted to be the one to find it. Not too far downstream, a small creek emptied in from the left. As my father's boat disappeared around the bend up ahead, I reluctantly turned my boat up the creek, slowed down some, and kept searching. The bow of the boat settled down, and the wake from behind sloshed up against the transom. Still, nothing. Why would there be? Common sense and knowing the currents would tell you that the kayak had drifted downstream, especially with the fast-running spring tides. Unless Mrs. D'Angelo had intentionally paddled up one of the creeks, there was no way they would have drifted here. I was cold. It started to drizzle, and the water froze on my face. I shoved my left hand under my thigh to try to keep it warm. I was thinking that Ben was probably freezing too, and scared to death by now. I know what being really cold is like. Middle of winter, I almost drowned in a cow pond when I was little, maybe eight. J.T. Digger and I were playing ice hockey, and I fell clear through the ice. The memory of that accident made me shudder. Abruptly, I leaned over to cut the engine. Let's think about. Let's think about. What clues in the text indicate that Brady might be nervous about searching the creek? Inferring, let's think about. Do you understand why Brady's own accident had such an effect on him? Monitor and clarify. Mrs. D'Angelo, I hollered at the top of my lungs. Ben, can you hear me? Nothing. Mrs. D'Angelo. Not a sound. I fired up the engine again and kept going. Up the creek, a couple private docks extended out into the water. Then there was a long strip of riprap near a construction site. From that point on, it was just shoreline with trees and a lot of brown cell bush. I kept going. But toward the head of the creek, a marsh taken over by a patch of tall fragmites warned me of shallow water, and I turned the boat around, not wanting to run aground. I sped up and came back down the creek, closer to the opposite bank. Still, no sign of a red kayak or a yellow life jacket. All I wanted to do was open the throttle and head down river to where the others were searching. My hands ached; they were so cold. I stuffed one hand in the pocket and hit the cell.
Let's think about why is it a good idea for Brady to have a cell phone? Background knowledge. Phone. I pulled it out and saw that I had one missed call. Turning off the motor so I could hear, I speed dialed home to see if Mom knew anything. Brady, hi, she said. Dad called. He said they found Mrs. D'Angelo. They did? Yes, downriver, near Spaniard's Neck. Is she okay? I asked. She's alive, Mom said, but just barely. They have not found Ben. They didn't. No, they lost the kayak, Brady. So Ben is out there somewhere in the water in his life jacket. Oh man, it's cold, Mom. I know, I know it's cold. Are you all right? Can you do this, Brady? I'm all right. I'm fine. I assured her. I need to keep looking. I ended the call and put the phone back in my pocket. We had to move really fast now. If Ben was in the water, his time was limited. Tilly started barking as I picked up speed. Quiet! I hollered. Let's think about why does Brady say that time was limited? Reread for clues. Monitor and clarify. Let's think about why do you think Tilly started barking? Predict. I wondered if I should waste my time going up any of those little creeks and inlets now that they had found Mrs. D'Angelo downriver, but Tilly was barking up a storm and stood with her nose pointed toward the river bank, where some of the water curled into a small cove. It was hard to ignore Tilly's instincts. Once she barked at the ceiling in our basement so insistently that my father pulled down part of the insulation and found a possum's nest made out of leaves. Better not be a squirrel or something stupid like that. I grumbled as I swung the boat toward the cove. I bit my lip uncertainly. Suddenly, Tilly had her front paws up on the edge of my boat. Her tail thumped back and forth, hitting my knees. "What is it, Till?" I asked, squinting to see through the drizzle. I slowed down the motor as we approached the narrow channel to the cove. Tall marsh grass obscured my view to the right, but as soon as we had motored around it, I glimpsed the remains of. Let's think about. What clue suggests that Brady might be close to finding Ben? Inferring. An old dock, a place where J.T. Digger and I used to fish, and a single bright spot of yellow. It was Ben. But as I drew closer, I could see that he was motionless, his small body hunched forward, the back of his life jacket caught on a jagged piece of old piling that jutted out of the water like a rotten tooth. Ben, are you okay? I hollered, pulling the boat up alongside. His eyes weren't right. Move! I ordered Tilly. Right away, she jumped back into the narrow space in the bow. I flipped the engine into neutral and reached over to pull in Ben. He was a lot heavier than I would have thought, probably because he was so waterlogged. The water was cold too. I grabbed hold of the collar on his life jacket and summoned all my strength to unhook him from that piece of wood. For a second, I lost my balance and nearly went in headfirst myself. But I fell backward instead, never letting go, and managed to pull Ben into my boat on top of me. It was a rough landing, and I hit my elbow hard on the gunwale. I just hoped I hadn't hurt Ben. Let's think about why is seeing a spot of yellow so important to Brady? Reread to find out. Monitor and clarify. The first thing I did was get his wet life jacket off. That and his soaked parka. Then I took off my own coat, wrapped it around him, and put my baseball cap on his head. I rubbed his hands. I patted his cheeks. Rubbed his hands. I patted his cheeks. 
but he looked terrible, lying there on the damp wooden floor of my boat, his face pale as a sheet, his eyes half shut, and his lips as blue as a fresh bruise. I was scared to death, because I didn't know what to do. I pulled the cell phone out of my pocket, but my hand was shaking so bad that the phone slipped right out of my grasp, hit the edge of the boat, and disappeared into the water. Oh, no! I exclaimed. I looked back at Ben. He needed help. I had to quit messing around. What do I do? What do I do? I was asking myself. What would Carl do? And I remembered those guys at the fire station talking about the ABCs. The first thing you did in an emergency was ABCs. A was airways. I looked at Ben's nose, clear as far as I could tell, quickly but gently. I knew you had to handle cold people carefully because of their... Let's think about... What do you think Brady will do after he drops his cell phone? Predict. Hearts. Their hearts can go kind of nuts and not beat right. I rolled him onto his left side. Some water trickled out of his mouth. Good, I said out loud. Good, Ben. B was what? B was breathing. Was Ben breathing? I pulled the choke out to flood the motor and shut it off so I could hear. But I couldn't hear anything. I put a finger under his nose and didn't feel anything. Was it because my fingers were numb with cold? The choke out to flood the motor and shut it off so I could hear. But I couldn't hear anything. I put a finger under his nose and didn't feel anything. Was it because my fingers were numb with cold? I stared at his chest, but I couldn't see it moving. Quickly, I felt with two fingers against his throat for that artery, the big one up there under your jaw, but I couldn't feel anything. No, I decided Ben wasn't breathing. Quickly now, I knew I had to, I rolled Ben back onto his back, then I bent over, pinched his nose shut, covered his small mouth with mine, and gave him two breaths. His lips were so cold they didn't feel real. I checked again. He still wasn't breathing. C. I remembered that C was circulation. Ben needed his blood to be moving around, too. Let's think about... Do you understand why Brady is trying to find out about Ben's condition? Reread to find out. Monitor and clarify. Oh, I moaned, thinking, I've got to do it. I've got to do CPR. I had been taught how. Dad and I took a class at the community center. We practiced on a dummy, and I watched Carl do it more than once. But would I remember? I tilted Ben's head back a little, pinched his nose again, and started by giving him one breath. Then I sat up, put the heel of my right hand on his chest, covered it with my left, and pressed down. Five times I pressed down. Five compressions. Then I bent over for another breath. Then five compressions. Then another breath. Then five compressions. I did not think about anything else as I did this. All I was doing was counting and pushing and breathing and praying inside that Ben would start breathing. Come on, Ben, I begged him. Five compressions, then another breath. Breathe, Ben, breathe! Ben needed to get to that ambulance fast. I had to get him down to the marina at Rock Hall. It wasn't that far, but I wasn't going to get there sitting here in the creek. Five compressions, another breath. I paused long enough to start the motor again and put the boat in gear. Five compressions, one breath. Then I headed my skiff in the right direction, grabbed the stern line, and looped it around the outboard's handle. Let's think about... What is CPR? How can you find out? Monitor and clarify. Back to Ben. Five compressions, one breath. Quickly, I reached for the stern line and wrapped it around a cleat to keep the motor straight. Five compressions, another breath. As if all that wasn't bad enough, 
It started to rain hard, too. I ignored it. I ignored the rain, the cold, everything, and just continued. Five compressions, another breath. A quick check to make sure the boat was headed in the right direction. I glanced up and down, but there was no one in the river. No one. I headed the boat downstream to Rock Hall and kept working on Ben. Five compressions, one breath. All the way down the river with the rain lashing my face and blurring my eyes until I saw a whirring ambulance light at the landing in the distance. I kept on with the CPR. I knew I couldn't stop. Maybe I should have. I could have slammed the boat into high gear and opened the throttle. But I also knew that Ben needed me to keep breathing into him. Let's think about... What is Brady's focus? How do you know? Inferring. Five compressions, one breath. We were almost at the landing. I heard someone yell my name, and Tilly started barking. Then more people were hollering, and there was a bank of flashing lights. At least two police cars, an ambulance. It was all a welcome blur. I continued, with five compressions, one breath. Suddenly, Jimmy Landers, one of Carl's co-workers, was hollering real loud. Keep it up, Brady! Keep it up! That's it! Pull the boat in. We've got it. Don't stop, Brady. Things happened even faster after that. Jimmy was down beside me taking over, then lifting Ben up onto the dock where Carl took him and continued the CPR. Then Jimmy jumped back on the dock too, and I saw Carl place his fingers on Ben's neck, checking for a pulse. Someone else pulled in the boat while Carl and Jimmy kept working on Ben, even as they carried him to the ambulance. Before a policeman closed the back doors of the ambulance, Carl shouted, We've got a pulse! There wasn't time for him to say anything more. The doors were closed and the ambulance took off, siren wailing, lights flashing. Completely out of breath, I stood on the landing, I don't have a clue how I got there, and watched the lights disappear. I thought about how we were all going to be on that rescue show. We were all going to be on Rescue 911, I thought. All of us, I bet. Tilly, too. Let's think about... Why wouldn't Brady know how he got to the landing? Reread for clues. Monitor and clarify. A policeman came over and put his arm around my shoulders. Good job, son, he said. He led me over to his cruiser and gave me a jacket. Go ahead, get inside and warm up. My dog, I mumbled. I was so out of breath, I felt dizzy. I can't leave my dog in the boat. The policeman called for someone to get Tilly, and both of us, Tilly and I, got in the back seat of the cruiser to warm up. They're taking him over to Lester Krebs Field, where they've got a medevac helicopter coming, the policeman told me. He pulled out a notebook. When you're ready, I need you to give us a little report. Let's think about... Based on the text and the illustration, what can you tell about Ben's situation? Inferring. I told him how I had found Ben. When the officer was satisfied, he offered me a ride home in the cruiser but I wanted to get my boat back, too. I assured him I could get home on my own. I don't doubt it, he said, grinning. The rain had let up some, so the policeman let us go. He said he would call both my parents to let them know I was okay and that I was headed home. Back in the boat, I put Ben's life jacket and his soaked parka to one side and picked up my Orioles hat from the floor where I'd done the CPR on Ben. It must have fallen off when they picked him up. It felt a little strange, putting that hat back on my head after what it had just been through, but my head was cold and I needed to get started. Everyone else had left the landing by then. It was over. I began to feel a little relieved. Tilly and I headed upriver just as it started to rain hard again, but Carl's voice, We've got a pulse, echoed in my ears, and I smiled. I think I could have driven through a blizzard right then. I felt both drained and elated. Let's think about... 
What is the policeman's opinion of Brady? How do you know? Inferring. I'll tell you this. I am not the type of person who prays very much. Hardly at all, really. But about a minute later, I stopped that boat right in the middle of the Corsica River in the pouring rain to fold my hands. I just sat there, with the engine in neutral, resting my head against the fingers of my tightly folded hands, because it had just hit me what happened. I'm not saying I cried, mind you, but I did have tears in my eyes. I thought about how it all happened, about fate. I mean, what if Dad hadn't been working in the shop that Monday? Normally, he'd be out on the water. If he had been, he wouldn't have come to get me out of school. There wouldn't have been the extra person to check the little creeks and coves the way I did. I knew then I would never be the same person anymore, because that day on the Corsica River, the day I lifted Ben off the piling, I had straddled the invisible line between life and death that runs down all our lives every second with every breath we take. And thanks to some good luck and timing, thanks to Tilly too, I had pulled Benjamin D'Angelo from one side to the other. Let's think about... Do you understand what Brady means by I had straddled the invisible line between life and death? Reread to find out. Monitor and clarify.